and welcome back to Good Morning Tobago on Tobago Updates. Viewers, first of all, I just want to wish every single one of you a very happy new year and much blessings and uh, um, everything that you hope for in this new year. Now, unfortunately, we started off our new year in a bit of a somber note, having lost two incredible men. One was uh, former Chief Secretary, our first Chief Secretary, Mr. Ho Choi Charles, who passed away on December 31st, 2023. And the other is, of course, our fifth Prime Minister, and that of Mr. Basdeo Pandey, who passed away last night, last evening, rather. So, um, you know, certainly condolences out to the families, but what an incredible loss for us here in Trinidad and Tobago. Two men that contributed so much to the development of the country and their loss is definitely felt throughout. Now, for the rest of this week, um, we are going to be here at the Assembly Legislature building as we discuss the life and the legacy of Mr. Ho Choi Charles. And um, he certainly left a lot of big shoes to fill. Um, he is irreplaceable within our space. And no one that advocated as much for self-governance and advocated for Tobago's development as much as he did. But before we get into those discussions about Mr. Charles, I want to spend a little time about, of course, Mr. Pandey, because we got those, that news just last night. Um, so I am being joined right now by former Assemblyman, uh, Mr. Gerald McFarlane. And a special good morning. Happy New Year to you as well, Mr. McFarlane. Thank you very much. And same to you. And I hope I continue having good relationship and chats with you, you know, as we do these programs from time to time. And of course, we had to take this opportunity in the beginning to express condolences on the passing of two giants, mm -hmm. you know, one in Tobago, a, a giant in the political and development of Tobago and Huchoy Charles, and another giant in Trinidad, by the name of Basio Pandi, the fifth prime minister, you yes. know. I mean, these two are literally legends, political legends and icons in this space, you know, and difficult to replace them. Certainly. No, but I want to get started we're talking about Mr. Pandey for a little bit. Mm. Um, in, in, in the eyes of Tobago, especially in the eyes of Mr. Charles, he was a bit of an interesting, um, they had an interesting relationship, <laughs> mm. so to speak. But, you know, um, what would you say about just his legacy, um, what he left behind, what he contributed to the nation of Trinidad and Tobago? Mm. Well, first I must say that um, Pandey was, it was, is, was one of the more charismatic leaders Certainly. or prime ministers we ever had. You compare him with Manning, Keats, um, who else? Um, Chambers, Williams, and all these people. Robinson, you know, there was no other prime minister as charismatic and feel loved, you know, by, by, by so many people. And I tell you, and given his um, his jokes and his way, well, you know, he like me had a little bit of thing in drama and so on. But at the same time, boy, you couldn't beat him with the use of language and words and phrase and, 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 and so on. You know, you couldn't touch him with respect to that. Although we had some prime ministers who was really good, you know, of throwing back jokes and so on. And, and saying that, you know, I remember once um, Manning in an election was saying that um, I'll beat them in the East, I'll beat them in the West, referring to Pandey, the UNC at the time. I'll beat them all over, I'll beat them like peas. <laughs> <laughs> Licks like peas. Manning telling Pandey, um, Pandey telling Manning, Manning, next morning, Pandey's on the television saying that he just came from the market and he understand peace, peace is scarce. <laughs> you know, that was one of the more interesting comments, you know, and, um, but on the other hand, you know, he was known for, you have to give him credit and it's still debatable, the position he took with respect to schools and the secondary school placement. Yes. You know, people were going there to secondary schools if he had a particular mark, 
If not, you just do go your repeat or, or something like that. He said, well, all children will have a secondary education, you know? And that was, in a lot of people's mind, that was exemplary and very worthwhile. Just that they have to put systems in place to take care of those slow ones and so on. I don't know if much of that was done, but the thing about it, he gave them an opportunity to go to secondary schools. And a lot of people benefited from that. Those who traditional would have failed the common entrance thing, you know, a lot of people benefited from that. And uh, some people fall through the cracks like you must expect. But he built schools, uh, secondary schools, yes. to support that policy position of the government. You know, I think no other government built so many schools, secondary schools to be exact, in any term of the, the, the government. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than 28 or 22 schools, secondary schools was built to facilitate that position, to the, each child get a secondary education mm -hmm. and to have more teachers employed and train up more teachers and get the whole thing working. It was a fabulous thing and we should be, I am proud of that particular period mm -hmm. and so on. And you have the comment that he made about morality. <laughs> Again, you know, politics have a morality That's of its own. Yeah. And you know, that is a, fa a fact. A true statement, you know, politics really have a morality of its own. But in our culture, that is not something that you must see. You know, you know that. Keep that low, you, you know. And Paddy was brave enough to say that. And that is what, you know, you know, people will fault him for. But, you know, this is a man speaking out and saying it like it is or however he feel. One of, his, one of the things that he did too was the airport construction which was a major airport, Piaco Airport reconstruction, I should say, because there was a Piaco Airport still, mm -hmm. but was in a state of disrepair and wasn't ne needed, you know. I think even um, Manning started it in a particular way or, or had a plan for it, and I think he executed it and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Although a lot of that, the, the corruption case coming out of that, you know, was a big scandal in itself. You know, we had a former government minister and others were charged for corruption or allegedly involved in corruption with respect to the airport construction, you know. But they did achieve the goal of changing the airport, something that the country has been talking about for years. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to give him credit for putting action in those, in, in those particular areas that comes to mind almost immediately. When he was in office too, if you should bring it to Tobago a little bit, there was a little issue from time to time with he and the Tobago House of Assembly. At one stage you had, um, not Hutchoy Charles, but I think um, Hutchoy Charles may be secure, secretary for, um, or secretary for something in Tobago. And then you had Ashua Jack, I think, with Hochoi Charles, if my memory serves me right. And then Pandey sent um, this boy, the minister, can I remember his name, um, to pave some road in Tobago. You know, no consultation. You just feel like you prime minister must come and pave some road in Tobago. And they had a big issue about it. And I remember Ashua Jack putting his car in the way. And I saw Jack was almost locked up, if I'm not mistaken, and the car was removed by a wrecker and so on, you know, and that caused a big hullabaloo. And I think Pandey get to realize, listen, they do just walk in and do things as they like here in Tobago. And that changed the relationship. And I think by that time, afterwards, I think soon after that, uh, this boy, um, London came into office and London tried to create a better relationship with Pandey. And uh, I remember Pandey using the term, uh, there must be corridors of communication. <laughs> you know, in other words, let us communicate, man. Communication will at least stop these issues if we can communicate. And that's a fact, you know. And Orville used that to the best of his ability to have better communication. And that works until um, Pandey went out of office, you know, because Orville went on to serve for 20, almost 16 years, I think, you yes. know. And then so, what about his mark on our people? Because, you know, one of the last times that I saw him in Tobago was he was here, I think it was in 2018, um, on a, upon an invitation from the spiritual Baptist community in Tobago mm -hmm. who wanted to honor him for what he had done for the Baptist community. Yeah, he established, I think, the holiday. Yes, he did. Spiritual Baptist 
something liberation day. liberation day you know and um it, it looked real bad eh? especially as all the previous <laughs> prime ministers you know who had a lot of them had some association with the baptist community oh. a lot of them you know and pandey took the come out straight and, and made some good points mm -hmm. with respect to that honoring and recognizing the role of the baptist community how they were so persecuted yes in the past in this country you know before independence and even after independence because they had this piece of legislation you know banning them from doing certain things you could imagine that mm -hmm. i mean we're looking at this thing now and uh, you know but 40 50 60 years ago that was the case in tobago to the point where an indian prime minister is indian prime minister not associated directly with the baptist community mm -hmm. but found it necessary to 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 um to have this this holiday in recognition spiritual baptist liberation mm -hmm. you know i think that was another good achievement on his part mm -hmm. and then just you know what about that relationship that he had with um former prime minister as well mr patrick manning of course we know who was his schoolmate mm -hmm. yeah that was quite interesting as well and i think both of them from south in school yes and the yes, schoolmate yes, i think was presentation and also they sure. used to lime together mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and lime and chat together and when come when they reach in the house they behave like uh, battle warrior battle warriors mm -hmm. and fighters and when they meet privately they have the night they could drink and chat and chew pikong at each other and so on but that is the nature of politics in, in, in some areas you know and manning was a good person to do that kind of thing have a good relationship with even his fools you know try to have a the, the, the communication going you know i remember manny used to come here sit down and chat with um with with with, with, with chief uh, not chief secretary chairman dinoon you know and, and so on and when we had problems of getting finance uh, we i i remember calling dinoon and say listen chief we had to find a way to call the prime minister and tell him in a serious situation for funding you know, and let me see what could happen. Was and I was in his um, uh, chief secretary's of uh, um, Chairman Dinoon's office, mm -hmm. and Dinoon take up the phone and call Manning, and say, "Listen, we are under some desire thing for funding. You have to help us in this situation." A phone call, you know. Yeah. And Manning said, "Chairman, man, come down, man. When you want to come down, let me come down and chat, man. Come and spend a day with me." And you know, four of us went: me, Alan Richards, Chairman Dinoon, who else? Claude, Claude Beno, and Benedict Armstrong went down and sit down and had a wheel of a time talking serious business and having a good line yeah. you know and from that we got some ease up from the funding the the the, 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 the way they used to treat us with respect to funding and it brought a new kind of relationship but soon after that you know he went out of office we call an early lecture and went out of office for a little while mm -hmm. so he was good at communicating with people and doing you know the basic and that is manning and so on but and he really is noted for that kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to go for a quick break, viewers. But please don't go anywhere because we'll be back right here at the Assembly Legislature as we discuss all the life of um, Mr. Ho Choi Charles, our first Chief Secretary. Good morning, Tobago on Tobago Update. Viewers, you are joining us live here at the Assembly Legislature building as we discuss the life and the contributions of the first chief secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, and that is none other than Mr. Ho Choi Charles, who passed away on December 31st, 2023, after ailing for some time, and certainly a tremendous loss to Tobago. But when we think about Mr. Charles, and Mr. Charles and us in the media, especially myself, we shared a very special relationship. And one thing that he taught me is to never go anywhere without the constitution, <laughs> and you need to know the Tobago House of Assembly Act by heart, right? So these two documents are always with me. Um, and, you know, so many times when he came on set with us, you know, he was always armed, always armed with the Tobago House of Assembly Act because it was so incredibly important to him. Because for him, he wanted us to know and to understand that the power that we have and the power that we need to attain, and of course I'm speaking about self governance and so on, which he advocated so much for until until his death, pretty much. And viewers, we are continuing our conversation this morning with former Assemblyman Mr. Gerald McFarlane, who served with Mr. Ho Choi Charles for, for some of his time in office. Mm -hmm. And you know, let's start there. 
with you know just being able to serve what was your time like um serving with mr charles <laughs> first let me just express my condolences to his wife and his children his family and some of his dear friends and supporters from that community and the tobago community over the years who stood with him through thick and thin okay. you, you know we really have to understand the kind of grief that they're going through right now with this more than a giant of a man hmm. in, in in tobago but um we we first had to you know look at you, you know the relationship with us was little um dicey at times but <laughs> you can't get away from the fact that he was passionate he was sincere he had a vision for what has to be done in this island of Tobago. And as a matter of fact, if you were to identify four political giants who wanted development for Tobago, you have to include people like Pam Nicholson, Hochoi Charles, APT James Fargo, and of course, Robinson, uh, and so those persons inside it. Mm -hmm. These are the persons, in my view, who in the Tobago space really conscientiously made sacrifices, you know, to change this place and bring about the kind of change that, that Ho Choi Charles contributed to or helped to bring about on this island space. Remember, he, <clears throat> he served, well, I served from 1984 to 1992 or 1996 and all those years he was with Hucha Charles there you know as secretary for infrastructure except for a short time when he was minister of um of minister in the ministry of national security you know there's an issue in the election and so on and the after the coup i think robinson asked him to come and serve as minister in the yes. ministry of national security and but all wherever he worked you know I remember him as a little boy because I was following politics even as a student in school. Mm. A little boy and he was a county councillor in the last county councillor in Tobago, uh, in Tobago here. What was he like in those days? Oh gosh, that is what I was really coming to, you know, but that's so quick. But he <laughs> really showed a kind of passion and a, new, and a difference and making Tobago different. Mm. He experienced as a councillor what happened in 1976 when after the motion for self-government and after the, the Robinson and, and um, Murray won the election and after the, the, the whole administration in Tobago was dismantled, people had to get a pay from Trinidad, all these files in Tobago had to go down to Trinidad, but all the, you had to go down and collect check and, and what, what kind of crap what's going on here, you wouldn't believe that a prime minister and a government will operate like that or so vindictive, you know, in that time. And so that is the kind of thing that caused people to purge themselves from the PNM administration in, in Trinidad at the time. And then they lost the government after, especially after the Basil Pitt lost that election in 1976, I think, you know. And, but Tobago was in a state of what you might call by so underdevelopment is not an appropriate word. And I could remember as a youngster as well, reading people like Horace Leighton Mills. He was the only Tobago correspondent that used to talk about things, I think in the Guardian at the time. And I think it went to the Express after a while. Horace Leighton Mills, he was the principal in the school in Roxborough, some private school he had in Roxborough. And then afterwards, people like Compton Delph helped to identify other things that were happening in Tobago and need to be exposed, you know. But I, as a little boy and as a young son, as a member of the Tobago House of Assembly, for example, when I, when I was campaigning, in 1984, for the election, the THA election, I brought Hutroy Charles and somebody else have a meeting in Mary Seal. That is the area I was going up for. In Mary Seal, Plymouth, Lescato, and these areas. And we saw the road going up to Mary Seal. And I tell Hutroy, I said, listen, we have to have a meeting right by that junction at that road eh, to let people feel and remember this is how the road is today. And in a few weeks time after we win the election, we're going to transform and make this road different. But that was an example of most of the main roads, you know, 
hmm. in Tobago, you know. That was an example of how the main roads on this island was doing. So when the first assembly, when they attempted to do many things from 80 to 84, which are child was Secretary for Works and Infrastructure, and they started a program, the government was saying, you can't fix the roads and you can't acquire, widen the roads because the roads had to be widened. You have to put up brace walls, you have to put in drainage and all this kind of thing because people were just kind of trying to patch, patch roads and the drain, no drain on either side. So the water running in the road, digging up the very road that you just patch, you know, that was a problem. And Cho Cho Child decided that, listen, the government were telling him, listen, you can't go and widen the road and encroach on people's private property. And we, they had to take decision that, listen, Ocho in particular has said that, listen, we are going to approach, since we are responsible for acquiring land, we're going to approach every person where we have to ride, widen the road, ask them to contribute and give us permission to widen the road. I can imagine places like going up from, you see that Arnesville road, going from Arnesville to Moriah, oh Lord. You wouldn't imagine what that road was. Precipitous on one side, no drainage, no brace wall. You hear that? Just precipitous. Especially, uh, coming from Black Rock to Plymouth, after you pass Mount Durfin with this wide road, you had to go around one dangerous bend by Pleasant Prospect. Hmm. You know? So the buses used to come as far as there at one point in time and just turn back. You can't come straight through to Plymouth or go to Black Rock. That road was so precipitous going around by the, super, by the little thing you have on that side. You're going on the edge of the sea, you know, hmm. going right around. And we approached a guy, James, an old man, James, to get permission without even consulting the government or anything. Widen the road, wide as a seat there today. That was done in the early days of the assembly. In order to, these are the decisions that Cho Choi Charles took brave, and we supported him in the assembly, to do these things, to expand and reconstruct the net road next road system in Tobago. And you, you go up then up to now, you go to places like um, Congo Hill, and some of these areas in Moriah, um, Golden Lane, Lescato, that Lescato Road, that Annasville, the whole Annasville Road was transformed oh. during that time. Connecting um, Lansome back to Charlottesville, that was done in our time. You know, connecting that, that was a cart road or a hunter's road during that time. Reconstructing the, um, the that road in um, coming from Devine's Road going down into Casta, Mount Dillon Hill, that was damaged by Hurricane Flora, you know. After some heavy rains or something, Hurricane Flora, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And that road remained unfinished and untouched. There is a pass through some estate road in the back. You know, you know where the present lookout is? There is yes. a pass through a road in the back to go down to Castara, which was as dangerous, but not as precipitous as the original road that was thing. Mm -hmm. And they cut that road and bench that road and have people passing back there, where you're passing right now, you know, to go from Devine's road into Castara. You know, so these are some brave and bold decisions that was taken in the assembly. And Ho Choi Charles got the name Heavy Roller <laughs> because he never considered any obstacle that you can't deal with, you know, even a big challenge like that, that Devine, that uh, Mount Dillon Hill, that was a big challenge. I used to be there watching them fellas going over the precipice and men had to pull them or pull a string by the thing, by the hand and tell them they can't go further because they can't see in front because it just dropped down suddenly, you know. It used to be an amazing feat to see how workers of the Division of Works used the D8 and D4 tractors that they had then you know, to bench that area so that people could pass. Bench and they put drains on both sides mm -hmm. so that you can't have that kind of um, washing of that mountain and landslide again. That to me was a significant achievement for, for road development, a good example of what could be done. Realigning all those roads going up to the country. As a little boy, you know, I, um, well, that was before when we came into the assembly, when I was going to Roxburgh Secondary, I spent one year going to Roxburgh Secondary. Me and Keith Roll used to be in the same car going up. And we used to wonder when this road could be realigned and change, mm. you know? Uh, Keith was in politics then and I was a student, you know? And I see after the THA came into being in 1980, and under Ho Choi Charles, all them areas used to pass around by Ho Farm, by a bridge that was breaking down, and all these areas. All them areas was realigned, straightened, widened, put up rails where you're going back to the sea, <laughs> you know, widened by the rock, 
If you know bad rock was. Oh, Lord. You know, so we can pay enough tribute to our visionary, mm -hmm. a man like Uchoi Charles. And I just want to stick there a little bit because, mm -hmm. I mean, my memories of um, Mr. Charles in governance was, I mean, because, I mean, I, I came from Trinidad. So we, mm -hmm. you know, my first experience at Tobago was in 1997 and my family moved in 1998. And that time there really was a lot of road construction happening mm -hmm. across Plymouth and all, all, all those other areas. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, what was remarkable was that Mr. Charles was doing all of these things with way less money than we're when we're than we're receiving course. right now. Mm -hmm. How course. how did how, how was he able to achieve that? A lot of it was done. You have to give credit to some of the workers and some of the supervisors in the division. We had people like Alison Williams who was just came back from studying and so on. Dr. Alison Williams now. Uh, we have people like Ellis Boris who came here, uh, who started and doing things. Okay. He went away and got his PhD and came back as well, but still aligned ourselves and came back to work in the THE. So at the technical level, we had capable people. You have to be thankful for that. And uh, the workers in the division, you know, um, I remember Alice Williams telling his father, who was a supervisor, you know, that listen, so you are my boss now? Alison saying, yes, I'm your boss. You're still my father. I'm your boss. But you know, they did all of that to have a new relationship with the, the workers, inspiring them, helping them to do things. They're working until four o'clock in the evening. And some of them working after four. You had very little money, but you had more productivity then because of the work attitude. Mm -hmm. And people like Mr. Wong, you know, a Chinese guy who used to be an engineer down at works as well. Very good at designing and constructing and project management. Excellent. He built that thing on the Esplanade, that um, thing to go preventing the water from coming in. And so and that building you see down at works that was designed by Mr. Young and workers of that division build that building on a chore park. We, could, we had urge meetings where we works was confined in a little building by Carrington Street corner there, you remember? That is the old works building. Mm -hmm. All our works people was there and the workshop on the next side of the road. But what about the policy direction from Mr. Charles though in making sure that, you know, getting down to the various divisions and so on, that they knew what the agenda was and they maximized what they had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he had a way to spread the thing over all the all the areas, you know? And I could imagine, you know, on reflection to it, I could imagine the kind of challenge this man had. The roads in Tobago was in such a state. And people see the doing things and succeeding. Roads would never exist to pave them or get them in a condition where it could pass, make them, make them passable, you know? If you could pave them, at least you had drainage for them. You know, you know how much years I wait for the drainage in Plymouth to be dealt with, <laughs> you know, as one of the early members of the assembly, you know, which I used to buff me up sometimes and say, Jerry, we can't do that right now. It place ain't flooding here. You, you know, you got to tell me the place ain't flooding, but the drains were in a deplorable state, you know, and you could, the road could not be supported well, especially on Shelburne Street and some of these other streets, you know. We had to spend a lot of money on the drainage. And boy, I tell you, People used to see as a result of the progress that he was making, they were getting much more demands from various parts of the country, of the island to do things. Mm -hmm. And with people like Alison, Ellis Boris, and others, and some workers in works, you know, they really shun and make a good example was a was a work ethic that was second to none that I've seen in this place. And the cooperation of the community. In getting things done, I tell you, people like who give them permission, yes, come on the land, take a six feet or 12 feet on either side because you have to make rules and you have to put drains mm -hmm. to control the water. That is a serious thing, a serious strategy in terms of the road improvement. You, know, you couldn't do the road without putting in some form of drainage. That was key. So we had a, a fairly good size money for drainage, you know, that, you know, people found that was unnecessary, but it was quite absolutely necessary. And some of those drains stand, stand up today. Stand up today, of course, you know, and with a greater number of buildings and so on, and the paving of all these roads, some of them are a little overwhelmed by the level of water in the rainy season and so on. But still, it is a mammoth mm -hmm. difference from what it was pre-1980 to what it is now. 
Yeah. And then, I mean, of course, we know Mr. Charles, he dealt with a lot of challenges, especially with where money was concerned, mm -hmm. and which is why he advocated so hard for the Tobago House of Assembly to get that 4.03 percent, between that 4.03 percent and 6.9 percent from mm. DRC. That mm. is so controversial now. Yeah, and I mean, they have to, they, they, I'm sure the new administration is going to resur resurrect that because there's an arrangement how that could be done mm -hmm. and who the committee should comprise of, how many members of THA and how many members of the government and I think they, 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 they Judiciary or somebody, you know, to, to be to be comprised of that. But, but that was good? directly yes. because of the level of financing they were getting, you know, and something had to be done. And that is what they, is a measure to put that in place. And all that is what was linked and was pushing the drive for greater autonomy for the island. So that, you know, we will separate and say, listen, we have to get a certain percentage, not just what you feel or you think you're going to give the Tobago House of Assembly to do their work. It just can't happen like that. You know, and before we run out of time, there are other areas that I think we want to touch with respect to Hocho Charles. Uh, um, we go for a break? No, not yet. Okay. All right. There's other areas that I think we want to go to touch with Hocho Charles. You see that scholarship program? Mm. That yes. was a big, big difference to this island. Although he focusing on road development and so on, and trying to harness the resources of people like Henry, who was an engineer and, all, and working with us for a while, um, Ellis and these other guys, you know, he felt that we needed more trained and skilled people in all areas. Mm -hmm. You saw that when he was Secretary for Health, for a little while. You saw that when he was Secretary for Works. You saw that when he was Chief Secretary. But that scholarship program, boy. Tobago, over the years, or during that time, hardly ever benefited from a national school. You know, for the people or the students from Tobago. Students like, I think, Martin George or his brother, and one or two other few will go to Trinidad and go to school and get a scholarship, you know. Mm -hmm. But somehow you can't get that in Tobago, you know. So we felt that it was absolutely necessary to set up some scholarship arrangement. And a team of people went to St. George's University, look and see what they were doing, because people from St. George's University were coming here to work as doctors mm -hmm. at that time, you know. And we realized, but wait, where is St. George University? This is not right in Grenada we're talking about, just next door to me. And we went on a campaign. You didn't get some national scholarships. Well, the THA is going to fund scholarships for persons to go to St. George's University. People like Dr. Duke and many other people benefited from those scholarships. Yes. You know, people like... Um, or uh, pathologists. Um, yeah. Uh, Boris. Pathologists. Well. We couldn't get pathologists. You know how long we had to wait for this, this, this guy from Trinidad to come to do pathology? We choose two Tobago doctors to go and do pathology. The Veens and who? Dr. Oh, Morris. Morris. Dr. Morris. You know, they went and do pathology on scholarship or recommendation by the THA. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of these doctors went and did and came back and served this island. And a lot of them out there serving different parts of the world as scholarship. I just spoke to um, Dawn, Dawn Friday, I think her name is, you know, another doctor benefited from these things. I think she's leaving today to go back to the state. A specialist in infectious medicine. All these specialist people you have outside and some came back to serve and some of them, they pushed them away and they've gone back to do different things. There's a fellow, Otley, one of the greatest, um, what you call these things, using um, mm -hmm. laparoscopy, you, you know, to do different surgeries and so on. Hundreds and thousands of surgeries, very skilled man, right from Tobago here, you know. So I am saying one of the ways in which we could refer, we could um, pay a tr serious tribute to Charles is not just by naming some road or some airport, well, the airport is already named, is to have a scholarship fund in recognition of the, 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 um, the work that Huchoy Charles and the Assembly did at that time, especially while he was Chief Secretary for that one too, to ensure that people get scholarships. Yes. A good friend of mine named Barry Joe Field, you know, he couldn't afford to go and do his master's on his own. He wrote to Huchoy Charles and he said, boy, that man ain't responding to me at all. One day out of the blues, without no prodding or anything, you know, get a call and just say, come, be ready to fund you, go and do your masters. 
You know, he asked in people, all the people I spoke to were the on scholarship. Never one day was asked, what is your political allegiance? Mm. Or anything like that. Or they had to do some research and they had to find out what you're thinking or what your political bias or anything like that. The man seemed necessary to do this thing and he sent people to do it. Mm. You know, and we had to, that is one of the things, just like how um, this guy in Bishops, this dentist who gave the scholarship, what is his name? Um, Bowles, Dr. Bowles scholarship. Every year you have a fund set up somewhere where you get scholarship from Dr. Bowles thing. Set up a special fund to give scholarship to somebody and call it the annual Huchoi Charles Scholarship Award. Certainly something that we can do for mm -hmm. here, us here in Tobago, but we're not done yet talking about Mr. Charles. I don't think we could ever be done with talking about Mr. Charles. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go for a quick break and we'll be right back. So viewers don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Good Morning Tobago on Tobago Updates. Viewers, we are continuing our conversations this morning with Mr. Gerald McFarlane, a uh, former assemblyman of the Tobago House of Assembly, as we discuss the life and contribution of the giant that was our first chief secretary. Secretary, Mr. Ho Choi Charles, who we unfortunately lost a couple of days ago. But uh, you know, one thing that stood out about Mr. Charles, and this is why I have this document here, which is the THA Act of 1996. I said earlier that he went nowhere without it. <laughs> and what did he, oh, every time you had an interaction with him, he impressed upon it the need for us to know this and understand it and be able to execute the powers in, in a way that can benefit Tobago. But talk to me about just the, getting to this point, the THA Act of 1996, how Mr. Ho Choi Charles took us to this point. Well, that, wasn't a, that was not only Ho Choi Charles, but that was a work of a number of persons, the Simongal draft, <laughs> and one set of other persons that was involved in putting different things together. Mm -hmm. I know when the first recommendation came about a Tobago House of Assembly and a week ago when it went to Williams at the time, Williams had a very watered down version that approved in the, in the House, you know, so he didn't bring the full responsibilities that we wanted. And uh, I remember Robinson and uh, Murray at the time in the house. Robinson walked out in disgust after they watered down the, 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 the motion uh, that Robinson was eventually, was eventually passed. Mm -hmm. With the support of the government at the time, a very watered down version. And, you know, at that time, they, they say, well, a three year term and other things that Murray stood up and said, listen, let me make this thing four years instead of three years because it resembles too much the county council. And there's a new kind of thing with more responsibility. You should give people more time as a term in the assembly. And we felt four years was the appropriate thing to do, which he did. But it, it calls for a lot of patience on people and a lot of drive and in spite of the obstacles, as I say, that's why they call him heavy ruler. But he was in a position to see what was happening? He was part of the, 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 the consulted, he consulted, and many of us consulted too with all these people who were drafting the legislation. You know, want to see came down to this. And, but some of us said, well, listen, at least it's a start, and we're going to see changes moving along and so on. And that is where we got to the point where Charles, as the first chief secretary, felt that, you know, we had to do things like go to the district resolution committee and so on to get more funding. And Charles recommended too, as part of that, um, that for the new kind of assembly with the greater responsibility for secretaries, that we should have administrators. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people frowned on it. And when he said, listen, the administrators will be close to the rank of a permanent secretary, or oh, some public servants laugh and so on, you know, because they didn't think it was possible. You know, they are some taking instructions from Trinidad and, and that kind of thing. And now in the THA, they're supposed to take no instructions from no politician and all kind of stupidness they were saying. But eventually, the public servants, as we see today, under people like Hochoi Child, you know, so the new kind, the new vision of the Tobago House of Assembly, Peter Reality, moved from 7 of 1980, 40 of 1996, you know, and all these responsibilities are there. The public servants in Tobago could be proud when I see them from 1996 to new administrators. It makes my heart really feel good mm -hmm. to know that I was at least a part of this system that brought this into being, you know? But unfortunately, we didn't see 
the level of, you know, people taking their work seriously. And over the years, you see the standard of, on the work ethic on the island just went down and went down and went down. And now it is at an embarrassingly low position in Tobago. Mm -hmm. You go to some administrators with some issues and they say, listen, I can't fight up with that right now. I'm not wasting time. I'm not going to this place. And I'm not going back to service commission and fight up with that. He's a lawyer and all kind of thing. He's taking up too much of my time. So people just doing what the hell they want to do in this place. And something has to be done about that. Certainly. Yeah. But I mean, when, when we talk about Mr. Charles as well, we also, things like PRDI come to mind, public mm -hmm. research and development. Policy uh, Research and Development Institute, right. I think. Mm. That, that he strives so hard to develop, mm -hmm. even though over the years um, it, it, it kind of fell away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what was, how, how did, how important was that? And, you know, what was his vision mm -hmm. behind that? Part of the problem in Tobago is data collection to help you make a decision and the level of research that was required to help you to be informed of making a proper decision. You know, that wasn't possible. The, the, what you had as um, CSO at the time wasn't really dealing with some critical information that we needed on the island. We have to just go on what we think and what we saw was happening and so on. PRDI was absolutely or something like that to make the planning division because the planning division didn't have the kind of people to deal with this kind of research that you wanted to do. Um, you had Beckles and I think Alan Richards. When Alan Richards came to Tobago, he, he um, was employed. He was in the planning division as a planning officer and then um, rocketed to the position of um, clerk and then to chief administrator, the first chief administrator. But these are things that was something that was absolutely necessary. And I, as a member of the Tobago House of Assembly at the time, agreed wholeheartedly with this approach. Mm -hmm. You hire people to be inside there, do some serious economic planning and analysis of what is required on the island, how we could move forward, what resources, human and financial resources that was required to do certain things on the island, how you could get it. And that is how DRC came into being because we can't depend or we can't move forward with a particular approach set up by or suggested by the PRDI without the necessary funding to do that and to funding to do the development of the island. Mm -hmm. And so the PRDI work was important to, 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 to give um, credence to the development initiative on the island to make it succeed. You know, you're not doing development by VAPs. You're doing it by do taking all the necessary, doing all the research, collecting all the necessary data to make informed decisions on plans, how we moving forward. Human capital development was a key thing coming out of PRDI too, because it was necessary. And in what you should note, eh, to show the unselfish nature of Huchoy Charles, who Choi Charles agreed to pay these people pretty high, more than higher than usual wages in PRDI. Some of them, I'm sure, were getting more than he as chief secretary. He felt that was no problem to he. He wanted to get the work of some of the best minds on the island to do work in the PRDI. And that is to show the level of unselfishness on part of Ho Choi Charles. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just can't forget this legend. We just can't forget this legend. And things like these and obstacles, he will find a way to, to get rid of these obstacles, find a way to get around it. Whether you go to huff and puff, whether you go to embarrass or cost somebody, he will do that as well. And uh, I feel that we really have to show and we invoke the dispute resolution, the DRC again, very soon. I'm sure the Chief Secretary will have to do something about that. Because although we never got the 6.9, which was the maximum, I think it's 4.2 or something, or 3.03. Yeah, to 6.9. We never even get half of that, you know. There must be some mechanism used, whether it's through the DRC again, invoking the DRC to come and look at this thing again and to see if they could set up some system where we can get more funding to do a lot of things here on the island. And I, then, another, uh, yeah. and then what about his passion for self-governance? Because we saw that he never gave up on it. Even He's the longest serving end. fighter for self-government and autonomy, you know, since after um, APT James. APT James and them started this thing and talking about home rule for Tobago in their little way and trying to do things 
APT James and them were doing it from their own pocket, you know, trying to do things, uh, help people, help road, uh, help to do road, uh, having tea and tech come here on the island with a new generator, expanding the services, starting for the port. They're like, oh, Lord. A lot of these people did their, their work in their little way in the beginning, but Ho Choi took this fight to different levels mm. during his lifetime. And this is what we, we, we ought to be proud of. And that is why I feel and it brings me to the important point before we close, is that people like Ho Choi Charles, not enough is ever done at an official level to chronicle the life of a man like that. Nothing is done officially to chronicle the lives of somebody like J.D. Elder. You know, and the kind of anthropological work and cultural work and thoughts, you know, that he did for this island. They thought of the, 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 the um, Heritage Festival. That was his original idea. Stanley Beard gave it life, you, you know, by sitting as an assistant secretary for culture with JD and Stanley. And we're talking about this, this, this issue of how we're going to get these villages involved in heritage and so on. What are we going to do? to chronicle the lives and have the history well recorded of the lives of people who pass and who are still alive today. What are we do now about Pam Nicholson's contribution to this place? Okay. Are we going to get somebody to serious sit down with Sister Pam and say, listen, we want you to be, tell us about your story. Tell us about the things that we don't remember and chronicle that so that the children who are coming now who in ABC and first year and in secondary schools could have something to look at and reflect on and say, this is how these people work together to achieve where we, would to do, where we are today. You know, this is the kind of politics and the kind of trouble they went through. This is how they use people and, and talk to people and they inspire others to reach levels of greater heights and so on. So I think something like, you know, you give a scholarship, even that same Ho Choi Charles scholarship fund that I suggesting mm -hmm. that should be done. You could decide and listen, give somebody who doing a PhD to do a PhD in history of politics in Tobago, yeah. governance or anthropology, you know, and take Ho Choi Charles to the start and look at all Ho Choi Charles works and recommendations and things that he was involved in. Yes. Give him a PhD, fund it and say, you the chronicle the work that he has done, whether in a part one or a part two, talk to the university, get somebody a PhD, do the work, that is a PhD thesis. And certainly something that would really, you know, embody who he was, because mm -hmm. he was like a walking, uh, dic a walking uh, library. Yeah. You know, whenever you... It's like the death of a, it's like a whole library lost there. Whenever then. you asked him about anything, he was like, Mr. Charles, I don't understand this. Mr. Charles would take you back all the way mm, from to the, the beginning. start mm -hmm. to make sure you understand Understand. And you learned so many things that you didn't know mm -hmm. at, at the end, end of the conversation because mm -hmm. he was so passionate about understanding the history and the, and the context and the reason why certain things need to be changed or the reason why certain things are what they are and mm -hmm. so on. So it's, it's definitely a lesson for us all and mm -hmm. perhaps a lesson for some of our scholars, our young scholars, mm -hmm. to take up this mantle in mm -hmm. making sure that our leaders... Mm. Our legends, like Mr. Charles, is remembered. Thank or you. contributors, or contributors, I like to call it. Serious contributors to the development of the silo. All right. Mm. So, Mr. McFarlane, I want to thank you so much for being on with us and having this discussion with us. It was certainly a pleasure with you this morning. Mm. Thank you very much. And I really look forward to the activities that, you know, doing, being done, they had to make updates and so on. And anyway, I can assist, I'll surely do that. All right, great. Thank you so much. And of course, viewers, for joining us this morning. It's certainly our pleasure. And all week this week, we'll be diving into the life and the contributions of that giant that was our first chief secretary, Mr. Ho Choi Charles. Bye for now.